Hi, everybody. Welcome to the second annual International E-Conference on Atheism. My name is Dr. Darren Slade, and I'm the president of the Global Center for Religious Research, which is hosting this year's academic conference. Now, something to keep in mind is that GCRR is not interested in converting or deconverting anybody from any particular belief system. We are strictly an academic institution, and we seek to approach the discussion of God and suffering purely from a scholastic standpoint, whether that standpoint is theistic, atheistic, or something else entirely. Now, that's actually, in fact, one of the greatest things about GCRR is that you're being joined by students, scholars, and specialists from all over the world with a whole bunch of different backgrounds and traditions, right from the comfort and safety of your own home. Also, as a special gift to everybody, all you have to do is go to gcrr.org, our website, and look up our newest publication called God and Horrendous Suffering. And with that, all you have to do is scroll down to the bottom, and you can download a special sneak preview of the book by clicking the preview button. And if you end up wanting to purchase that book, we do recommend that you go through the GCRR website because our prices are a lot lower. Uh, but also, we're going to give you 15% off more then uh, on the retail price. All you have to do is use the promo code SUFFERING, and that's all in lowercase. Use the promo code SUFFERING at checkout. And with that said, I want to introduce you to my very good friend and our next presenter, Ryan Klein. And allow me to share my screen so I can give a proper introduction. So Ryan's discussion today is called Paul Ricoeur and the God After Theodicy. He is a teacher of literature and philosophy for middle and high school students. He has a master's of teaching and classical education from the Templeton Honors College of Eastern University. And he is currently studying philosophy at the graduate level at Boston College. His work focuses on the relationship between reason and tradition, uh, the role of virtue in human flourishing, and the role of education in promoting human flourishing. He has written for the Searcy Institute and Front Porch Republic. We're very lucky to have him. Now, Mr. Klein, thank you so much for doing this. I'll turn it over to you. You have the floor, sir. Well, thank you very much for the introduction, and thank you all for being here. I'm, I'm very honored to have you here to talk to me about some of the things I've been thinking about. I find Paul Ricoeur, a continental French philosopher, a particularly interesting figure for a conference on atheism. Um, he wrote, for example, one essay called Religion, Atheism, and Faith, where his question was, what religious value does atheism hold? What, In what way can religion be improved by the insights that are had by masters of suspicion like Freud, Nietzsche, and uh, Marx. And I, I think his, his answers are, are quite insightful and worth consideration. So I'll share my PowerPoint here and we'll begin. So my paper for today is called Paul Ricoeur and the God After Theodicy. John Caputo began a book on continental philosophy with the question, who comes after the God of metaphysics? That he can begin a book with this question suggests that the death of the metaphysical God, whoever that is, is already settled. Indeed, that there is a whole book to follow this question suggests that for many philosophers, this suggestion is right. The metaphysical God is dead. Um, Caputo and Richard Carney, in particular, are known for pioneering this search for God after God. Richard Carney calls this anatheism, as opposed to atheism or theism. Philosophers seem to have given up on some sort of God, and yet many are searching for a God after God, a God in a new mode. Recur is one of these. But before welcoming a new God, it's important to clarify how the first one died. Paul Ricoeur explores this death in several places, especially a, a book called Evil, A Challenge to Philosophy and Theology. For him, the dead God is the God of theodicy, a being supposed to be rationally reconcilable with evil. Such reconciliation is impossible, he says. Such a God must not be believed in. And after this God's death, we must instead turn to new kinds of work, the emotional work of enduring evil. But Quite surprisingly, I think, Recur includes in this emotional work after evil, prayer. How is prayer possible after God? To what God may we pray after theodicy? Who is Recur's God after God? That's the question I want to ask here. 
I'll articulate two interpretations of recur, one which is more atheistic and one which is more anatheistic or theistic. And I'll argue that only the more theistic interpretation makes Recur's project possible. To be more specific, the god Recur rejects is a uniquely modern hyper-rational god, and the god his post-theodicy position requires is not a god who's limited in love or power. It is instead an omni-god whose relationship to evil is not explained by metaphysics. To get there, I'll begin by categorizing evil, the essay that Recur wrote, as a story, which has to be evaluated as a story. I'll then tell the story, noting its rising action climax in denouement. I'll initially interpret that climax to be atheistic, but then argue that this would make the denouement impossible and the story unsuccessful. It is only if we interpret the climax paradoxically, non-speculatively theistic, that the story coheres and can offer catharsis as a good story should. So I'll begin by talking about the methodology here. Different genres of writing come with different standards of excellence. Before attempting to evaluate Recur's essay on theodicy, we should pause to ask to what genre it belongs. It's not a series of syllogisms like the Summa Theologica. It's much more similar to the genre assumed by who he calls the masters of suspicion, Freud, Nietzsche, and Marx. Recur characterizes this genre as one which is, does not engage in metaphysical arguments. Instead, he says, it develops a new kind of criticism, a critique of cultural representations considered as disguised symptoms of desire and fear. We might say that instead of arguing in a scholastic way, suspicion tells a story about the people who argue, trying to reveal the motivations beneath their arguments. David Bentley Hart makes a similar assessment of Nietzsche's critique of Christianity, similar to what Recur says, I think. Hart says, it's Nietzsche's art aesthetic evaluation that remains unassailable. The metaphysical aspects of his critique are facets of an imaginative narrative, an attempt at a more compelling story, whose appeal is rhetorical, whose logic is figurative, and whose foundation is none. Hart doesn't mean this as a dismissal of Nietzsche by any means. It is a praise of his narrative rhetoric. The masters of suspicion tell moving stories, that is the force, and Recur's treatment of theodicy is one such story. Before attempting to evaluate Recur, then, we have to ask, how does one evaluate a story? Hart claims a refutation of Nietzsche must be a refutation on Nietzsche's own terms. Nietzsche paints Christianity to be vulgar and nihilism tasteful because Nietzsche's standard of success is good taste. Therefore, says Hart, the most potent reply a Christian can make to Nietzsche's critique is to accuse Nietzsche of bad taste. Hart's method is not to impose a standard from without, but to ask whether the story meets its own standard. I find that method helpful and um, apt for a story. I'll imitate it by asking what standards Recur's story sets up for itself, and then asking whether it meets those standards well. I will argue that one such standard is the catharsis of the story's denouement, whether it is satisfying, whether it can um, offer emotional con comfort for those who suffer as it attempts to. The success of the story depends on whether such catharsis, emotional comfort is possible. So I'll start by going through the story that Recur tells about theodicy. This is really a story. It's not a long drawn out metaphysical engagement with many philosophers. He's capable of doing that, but that's not what he does here. In talking about this story, I'll, I'll quickly define these three terms, rising action and climax and denouement. A rising action I'll refer to mean the events in which an audience experiences gradual tensing of plot lines as a story develops which leads to a climax, the explosive moment in which tension reaches a peak. After a climax, the audience experiences suspense and tension as they wait to see what the climax will cause. And this revelation, this coming together is the denouement. The denouement is a moment designed to release tension and resolve conflict. It is intended to bring catharsis, release of emotions in the audience through emotional closure. Indeed, the denouement must bring catharsis to satisfy the audience successfully, as Recur will explicitly attempt to do. In this paper, I'll ask under what conditions it's possible for Recur's story to offer the catharsis it attempts to offer. So we'll start with the rising action. 
Ricoeur tells a story about levels of discourse in the West that respond to the presence of suffering in human life. He begins by saying that we experience suffering between the poles of reprimand and lamentation. We suffer and we ask, what did I do to deserve this? We ask, whose fault is this? Such questions look for an explanation through fault. Did I do this? Is this the fault of someone else? This leads us into discourse about suffering. And Ricoeur distinguishes five levels in the history of Western thought. The first he calls mythology. In mythology, we tell stories about how evil came into the world. But these stories in the Western tradition turn out not to be enough for us. It's one thing to ask where disease comes from. It's another to ask why my children die when other children live. A story doesn't satisfy this. Desiring more explanation, we rise to a new level of discourse, which Ricoeur calls wisdom. In wisdom discourse, we attempt to make rational theories to explain suffering. A prominent theory in which Ricoeur is interested is the theory of retribution, that all suffering is punishment for sin, as in the biblical story of Job, some of his friends insist, you must be suffering because you must have committed a sin for which you're being punished. But this sort, this theory for Ricoeur seems to fail, for it is evident that often the wicked prosper and the righteous suffer. Such a theory cannot account for this. Thus, the righteous Job refuses his friend's explanation. Seeking a better explanation, Western civilization rises to a third discourse. Ricoeur calls this Gnosticism. In Gnosticism, we combine mythology and wisdom. We tell a narrative according to which evil comes from an ongoing battle between gods, one god of light, one god of darkness, uh, competing for the fate of the world. Gnosticism is a myth, it is a story, but it is also highly rationally systematic. There is much metaphysical principle and syllogism going on there. For this reason, Ricoeur calls it a rationalized myth. The Gnostic myth is famously rejected by Augustine, who reduces the god of darkness to a privation of being, saying instead that there is only one god, the god of light, responsible for everything. Ricoeur says this is where we begin to speak of an omni-god. Humanity suffers evil here not because of God, but because of a privation in their own being. This is a new rationalized myth, which Ricoeur thinks is different in content from Gnosticism, but is similar in structure. It is another rationalized myth, and it is where what he calls ontotheology begins, the framework in which God is the highest being who grounds all other beings, who is responsible for everything which happens in the world. This is a new kind of explanation of suffering, but in the West, in this story, it does not suffice. Once again, a new troubling question can emerge. How could such a God allow evil? If God is responsible for everything, then from whence evil? Why doesn't God stop genocides? These questions raise us from Gnosticism to a fourth level of discourse, which I call the climax of Ricoeur's story. And this climax is theodicy. In theodicy, the fourth discourse, West, the West attempts to understand how it is possible to affirm at the same time without contradiction, three propositions. God is all powerful. God is all loving and yet evil exists. The Odyssey seeks cohering, non-contradictory statements, a rational account of reality. It tries several kinds of solutions, but in Ricoeur's brief recounting, all of these fail. We wonder whether God is using evil for the sake of good, but we realize that the complaint of a sufferer wrecks the notion of compensation of evil with good, he says. Um, Emmanuel Levinas says this in another way, that we cannot say to someone suffering in a concentration camp that evil is part of God's good plan. Such an explanation dies on our lips as insufficient. We try other kinds of theories. We try to say that ontotheology reveals that God must allow imperfection in creation, but Ricoeur thinks this is debunked by Kant. We try saying that evil is an unavoidable element of spirits march towards perfection, as in Hegel, but Ricoeur says this does not ultimately justify the sufferings of victims. It just marginalizes them further. Ricoeur thinks all these explanations which we have tried, all the major attempts of theodicy have all failed. Uh, the, the most laughable, in a sense, is Leibniz's best of all possible worlds. Voltaire was right to lampoon it as ridiculous. Um, 
not not tenable, not really even ethical to attempt. The logical problem of evil proves unsolvable in the West, and theodicy fails. It would therefore seem that metaphysics fails in theodicy. The omni god, the fully god, fully good, fully loving, fully powerful god is impossible to justify in the presence of evil. And so the god is dead. It is worth noting again the way in which Ricoeur critiques the Odyssey here. He doesn't engage with the hundreds of books which attempt to defend the traditional God. He really does not argue. He tells as one tells a story. This is a climax of a narrative which will flower most colorfully in the denouement to come. However, uh, before this denouement, the West tries one more level of discourse which is worth articulating. Fifth, we reach the discourse of broken dialectic or broken theology, which is something attempted by Karl Barth. Ah, I've gone one too far. For as Recur recounts it, Barth's broken theology realizes that the ever since Augustine, we've carried forward an assumption we ought to reconsider, namely that this is a block quote: the propositional form in which the terms of theodicy are expressed. And the rule of consistency, which it is thought that the solution must satisfy, these are problematic. There's no account taken of the fact that the task of thinking, of thinking of God and of thinking of evil before God, cannot be exhausted by our reasoning, which is modeled on non-contradiction and our proneness to systematic totalization. We attempt to totalize in a non-contradictory way, but this itself might be a problematic attempt, a problematic attitude. Broken theology instead, rejects these presumptions, attempting to open a new path to thinking about evil, a new way of thinking. For Bart, evil is a nothingness, the absence of God's grace. So far, so Augustinian. Bart's innovation is his inference that evil is, quote, altogether inexplicable. The explicable is subject to a norm and occurs within a standard, but nothingness is absolutely without norm or standard. It is outside the sphere of systemization. Evil is not compatible with God's power and goodness for Bart, and yet Bart does not deny God's power and goodness. He is in this way an Orthodox Christianity Christian after theodicy. But this is perplexing. How is this possible? How do we say that these things are not compatible and yet affirm them? all the same. According to Recur, Bart rejects this explanation. How is this possible? Is it possible? I will offer two ways of reading what Recur thinks about this, one which is atheistic and one which is more theistic. I'll first consider the atheistic interpretation, returning to the, uh, the later more atheist, more theistic one in the fourth section. So first, the atheistic reading. In the first version of the evil essay in 1985, Ricoeur considers Bart pretty briefly in one page. He says that Bart succeeds up to a certain point, but beyond it, no. Up to what point? To the point when it acknowledges its broken condition is irretrievable. For Ricoeur in this reading, Bart does well in rejecting the logical possibility of theodicy, but he does poorly in adding a breach into this new thinking. Bart, for example, uses imagery of God's hands, saying that with his right, God commands goodness, and with his left, he commands nothingness. But this, for Ricoeur, seems odd. Does this not make God the source of evil? Ricoeur says, if this is not a covert concession to the failed theodicies of the past, and therefore a weak compromise substituted for a broken dialectic, does it not reopen the way to speculations on the demonic aspect of the deity? In other words, if God is in control of evil, and evil happens because God is behind it, he's less than fully good. If God is in control of evil, and yet evil happens without God's say-so, we seem to be in a contradiction. If Bart's suggestion is merely to accept contradiction, then his suggestion is irrational. How does thinking in this case guard itself against what Ricoeur calls the drunken excess which Kant denounced? In either case, whether God is behind the occurrence of evil or not, we have a problem, either an evil God or an irrational position. Ricoeur considers both of these to be failures. Thus, the Odyssey fails to justify God again, and we must reject its premises. God must be less than fully good or less than fully powerful. 
I'll note too that John Capullo makes camp here saying that indeed this does not work out. The only way to resolve it is to say that God is less than fully powerful. The Omni God is dead and we must turn away from thought in the story's denouement. Now, again, this is the more atheistic reading of what Ricoeur thinks about Bart. There's a different reading, which I'll offer later, but first let's go from here and move on to how Bart and or how Ricoeur ends the story. Let's get to the denouement on this basis. In the failure of thought to reconcile God and evil, Ricoeur suggests turning to action instead, what we can do about evil. Instead of explaining evil, let's find what we can do to minimize it. After this, he suggests that we need to go on an emotional journey in which our feelings about God and suffering can be transformed. I'll focus more on the emotional journey. In the first stage of this emotional journey, Recur says, we acknowledge the ignorance we've reached about evil, and we incorporate it into the work of mourning. We say to those who suffer, quote, no, God did not want that. Even less did God want to punish you. I don't know why things happened as they did. In the second stage, we reach the idea of, or we reject the idea of divine permission, the notion that God neutrally allows evil, and we turn lament into a complaint against God. We hold God accountable, expecting him to do what he ought, crying with the impatient hope of the psalmist, how long, O Lord, how long until this evil is dealt with and gone away? In the third stage of the journey, we discover that belief in God need not explain the origin of evil. We are scandalized by suffering, for indeed, he says, suffering is a scandal only for the person who understands God to be the source of everything that is good in creation, including our indignation at evil. Here we believe in God in spite of evil. After this third stage, Recur says there may be some further wisdom possible, um, perhaps what Job knows at the end of the biblical story, when it is said that Job comes to love God for naught making Satan lose his original bet, but Recur thinks such wisdom is not taught. So this is the denouement, uh, which ends the 1985 essay and its story. We move away from thought and we attempt to provide emotional comfort to the sufferers by saying God did not want that, by saying we must complain against God until he does something. And in the end, we believe in spite of evil. Does this work? That is a question which I think we need to consider. Let's begin with thinking about the role of a denouement. This is me responding to recur at this point. As we discussed above, a denouement attempts to offer catharsis, without which a story is unsatisfyingly tangled or raggled or not put together. If Shakespeare had unironically followed the death of Hamlet by giving Horatio a speech about how everything had worked out well, while there's dead bodies on the floor, Hamlet would make less emotional sense and it would fail to satisfy us in the way that it tried to. It would not have a tragic catharsis. Just so, the success of Recur's story depends on the possibility of his denouement. Recur claims that where theodicy failed to reconcile God in suffering, the death of theodicy allows us to separate evil from God, demand divine justice, and believe in spite of evil, which is a more satisfying position than that of theodicy. I will argue here that insofar as the omni-god is dead, insofar as we interpret him in the atheistic reading, this denouement is impossible and catharsis cannot happen. Let us first consider what presuppositions we must hold to follow this emotional direction of recurs. Recur first tells us to say to the sufferer, God did not want that. Recur even has us reject divine permission of evil. This leaves no middle ground in which we could say God was indifferent about an evil. We must go all the way in saying God willed against that evil. In other words, God loves the sufferer and wills her good. If we may say this to any sufferer, as Recur seems to suggest, then we must say God loves all sufferers. God is then all loving, omnibenevolent. Recur next encourages in the second stage, he encourages sufferers to cry in impatient hope, how long, O Lord? But if all sufferers can rightly expect God to help them and accuse God when he does not, then all sufferers must thereby hold God to be capable of doing something about their suffering. This makes God out to have power over evils, capable of righting them. In other words, all-powerful, omnipotent. 
The God of emotional comfort then must be omnibenevolent and omnipotent. If Ricoeur offered only one of these two comforts, he would be bound to only one of these omnis. If, for example, we only said, no, God did not will that, we could believe in God's love while explaining evil by saying God is weak. Perhaps he wants to help, but he cannot. This is uh, Caputo's position in many places, for example. Conversely, if we could only say how long, O Lord, but not God did not want that, we could believe in God's power while explaining evil by saying that God is not all loving. Perhaps he can help, but he does not want to, and we have to try to convince him. This would make God out to be something like Zeus. But if we say both of these comforts together, as Ricoeur advises, we find ourselves believing both in God's total love and his total power, at least implicitly. We may not understand this love and power, but offering this comfort requires us to believe in them, at least analogically. Indeed, it's only if we believe in this combination that we reach the third stage, believing in spite of evil. Suffering would not be a scandal if we believed in Zeus, for Zeus is neither omniscient, omnipotent, nor omnibenevolent. In Greek mythology, most suffering happens without Zeus's knowledge, approval, or allowance. Some suffering happens because Zeus wills it, it entertains him. In the presence of a limited god like Zeus, suffering is horrible, but it is no rational scandal. Scandal, believing in spite, requires an omni-god. But let's consider an objection. I've said Recur encourages all three of these stages simultaneously. Is it possible he doesn't mean us to think all of these at once? Perhaps as moments in a journey, we are to leave each stage behind as we take up the next. In this case, we do not arrive at the pairing of God's total love and power. But if we were to drop God's love when we arrived at his power, after which we dropped God's power, we could not reach the third stage, believing in spite of evil. This third stage, the culmination of the journey, must accumulate presuppositions, presuppositions rather than dropping them. Even the advanced impossible to teach wisdom of Job to which recur gestures, finding value in suffering, solace in a suffering God, peace in renouncing desires, contains nothing incompatible with the omni-God. Recur says that if Job renounces his accusation about the injustice of his lot, it is not because he rejects God's power or love, but because he loves God gratuitously. Indeed, we might also add that in the story of Job, Job tells the Lord at this point, I know you can do all things, suggesting Job's faith and omnipotence. So Recur's emotional direction leads us to the implicit omni-god, whom Job embraces beyond metaphysical discourse. Let's then consider the story as a whole. If the climax of Recur's story includes a total rejection of the omni-god, his denouement is impossible. The aporia after theodicy would lock us into the options theodicy tried to avoid, a god limited in love, a god limited in power, or no god at all. In any of these cases, we could not say both God did not will that and how long, O Lord, as Recur would have us. The story could not deliver its promises nor deliver the catharsis of a good story. In this reading, the story is tangled and unsatisfying. Is there a possible version of the story in which the denouement is possible and the story is harmonious? I will argue that there is. We can construct it by reading the climax differently or reading the broken theology bit differently, um, especially in light in two other essays by Recur. Section four, a possible denouement. This requires us to go back to the climax, what is the fate of theodicy? In his 1998 essay, Lamentation is Prayer, Recur considers how the familiar themes of lament and complaint in biblical narrative may be a path towards God after theodicy. Through prayer, we may be capable of a theology of paradox, as he calls it, that can comfort mourners. He notes that Psalm 22 exemplifies such a paradox. On the one hand, it cries, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, as Christ says on the cross? And yet, at the same time, at the end of the psalm, it speaks of God as Savior. One last thing you might want to know 
is that the Global Center for Religious Research has established the most comprehensive international research group to study the causes, manifestations, and treatment options for those suffering from religious trauma. Uh, but we have a big problem. See, in order for victims of religious trauma to receive help, we need to arrive at a place in our culture where religious trauma is recognized as a real mental health condition. And unfortunately, the academic study of religious trauma is still in its infancy. This means that there are no exhaustive empirical studies to support what we have seen and experienced, that religious trauma exists and is a chronic problem. As it stands, really only anecdotal case studies have been published so far, but nothing substantially empirical. And GCRR wants to correct this gap of knowledge, and we're hoping to get your help with that. So we have set up a GoFundMe page in order to crowdsource the world's very first most comprehensive sociological study on the existence, causes, and manifestations of religious trauma. Now, the reason we are crowdsourcing this stuff is because we were actually set to get a grant, federal grant for this research project, and then the federal government halted all funding for mental health research. So we were left holding the bag. That's why we're hoping the public can join us in this effort. All you have to do is go to GoFundMe.com and search for the phrase Religious Trauma Sociological Study, or you can click the link that I'm going to put in the chat box. And at the very least, uh, please share this GoFundMe page across all your social media platforms just to get the word out about this really important uh, research project.